Western allies impose sweeping sanctions against Russia because of the war in Ukraine. Two years on, and the Russian economy is expected to grow faster than any in the European Union. So, what's the secret behind Russia's economic resilience? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Western sanctions against Moscow were meant to cut the legs out from under the Russian economy, crippling its war effort. But wartime spending is bigger than ever. So just how is Russia keeping its economy going? A defiant Kremlin after more sanctions are imposed following the death of Alexei Navalny. Nothing fundamentally new was announced. The Russian economy has shown its stability, and in this case, this probably can even be said not just by us, but according to US representatives, the Russian economy has demonstrated its stability, it has adapted, and it continues its development. The data suggest he is right. Russia grew faster than the rest of the G7 countries last year and is expected to do so again in 2024. Revenue from oil and gas dipped slightly after the West imposed sanctions and a price cap. But Russia found other buyers like China and India. Russian President Vladimir Putin has one goal, to win the war. Defense spending is expected to increase to 6% of GDP this year. That's about three times what Europe spends. Research suggests, though, that Russia is running a sizable budget deficit. Income has not kept up with outgoings a gap that's likely to grow as long as the war drags on. Russia is also facing a labor shortage. Hundreds of thousands of its people have gone to fight. It's thought even more have fled to avoid military service. Enticing workers into war-related factories has meant increasing wages. Higher salaries increase demand for goods, all at a time when the ruble is falling. And that leads to another issue, inflation. Unfortunately, our inflation has increased. This is true. By the end of the year, it is expected to be 7.5%, maybe a little more, up to 8%. But by most metrics, Russia's economy has exceeded expectations and mostly shrugged off the financial fallout from the war. If money hasn't brought the conflict to an end, what will? Earlier, I sat down with Russia's ambassador to the UK, Andre Kellin. He says Russia's economy can withstand Western sanctions. Ambassador, I'd like to talk about the economy now, if I may. How is Russia's economy doing after two years of war? It's a very interesting question because uh, uh, the economy has uh, changed uh, very seriously uh, in a sense that uh, we have uh, to, to do a lot of things uh, that uh, we can we couldn't have done uh, during uh, some 10 years before because since every, a lot of people were saying that Russia should make reforms in its economy uh, but it was difficult for the government just to start seriously to do that right now uh, since operation starts it is now the objective necessity to change dramatically economy uh, to reorient uh, the uh, trade to reorient it to the east uh, to um, uh, to do to deal with sanctions to make productions of our own uh, and we produce not only military weapon we produce we started to produce our aircrafts our cars a lot of things that has soviet union previously has been done and the result agriculture as well uh, make better and the result is now uh, clearly seen since the growth uh, of uh, gdp last year was 3.6% uh, it's a lot and prediction for this year uh, they are also very high it is more than 2% so uh, we do not see that uh, any trouble we have overcome sanctions of course i was just uh, about to mention sanctions so sanctions. they've had no impact no, on they, russia of course they have an, they have an impact we lost uh, a big market in the in the west uh, that is true. Uh, our trade with the United Kingdom uh, now diminished 96 percent. Uh, so the remainings is very small. But this is bad for, for not for us. 
it is also bad for the United Kingdom because uh, we, we, you see that the situation in the economy of the United Kingdom, they are also suffering. It is around zero plus uh, something plus, something minus, but it is stagnating right now. Uh, so it is more damage for the countries in, in the West than for us. Uh, we also, of course, suffered from that. Uh, some of technologies we have now to invent ourselves or to get in connections uh, with China, with India, with Indonesia, with uh, all countries uh, in, in, in the East. Uh, but uh, this is not uh, catastrophic. It is, it is just uh, getting us to learn something more about that and to work with these markets, with these new markets. Well, let's meet our guests. Richard Sakwa is Emeritus Professor of Russian and European Politics at the University of Kent here in the United Kingdom. Vicky Price is Chief Economic Advisor to the Centre for Economics and Business Research and former Joint Head of the UK Government Economic Service. Chris Weaver is a founding partner of Macro Advisory. That's an independent political, economic and strategic risk consultancy. You're all very welcome to this edition of Roundtable. Vicky, what is a war economy and how does it work successfully? A war economy is one where a very large percentage of its spending goes on uh, manufacturing ammunition, for example, or using quite a lot of people, of course, from the population to either train them on using that ammunition or going out and fighting the war. But it just means that you transfer quite a lot of resources that could have gone to other things um, into defence, which has interesting implications. It employs quite a lot of people, but it moves you away from possibly doing other things that you could have done for long-term sustainability of the economy. So basically everything is focused on defence, military, all of the money that could go towards healthcare, education, other government departments. It depends oh. what you mean by all. I mean, what is happening right, right now in Russia, we're talking about at least 50% of its budget going to the war economy, if you like. Uh, there is loads left for other things. And of course, the interesting thing is that Russia, despite the fact that there have been so many sanctions and, uh, and of course also prohibitions in terms of you know, buying its oil and its gas, what it has been able to do is continue to sell it to other places like Turkey and China and India, uh, and also get quite a lot of goods that um, wouldn't have been able to get otherwise because of the sanctions via other routes, um, Central Asia, for example, and, and other countries that are quite prepared to do that. So the result is that the rest of the economy has continued to do reasonably well. And also, of course, that people who are employed now quite significantly in the defence sector are able to go out and spend. And uh, what we've seen is that the economy has actually done rather well um, as a result of that, a lot, lot better than had been anticipated. Yes, there was a fall in GDP in 2022, but 23, so an increase of just over 3%, and it's likely to be something similar, maybe between 2 and 3%, according to the International Monetary Fund in 2024 as well. Richard, would you say Putin has made a success so far of his war economy? Yes, what they've shifted towards is what's called a military Keynesianism. So they're sort of expanding. In fact, the, the economy is in danger of overheating at the moment, uh, as Vicky says. Um, well, my figure is usually 40% of the budget is spent on arms at the moment, 10% of GDP compared to, say, UK, just over 3%. So, yes, it has. It's supplying the uh, munitions, uh, the drones, the artillery, all the rest for the, for the war. So it's a success in those terms. Obviously, the policy issues are a different question, but in purely in sustaining a long campaign of attrition with also mobilizing uh, manpower for the war effort, it has been so far. And in fact, it's gaining tempo uh, as we go look to the future. Do you think people are surprised that Putin has made a success then of this war economy? Well, it's certainly uh, disappointing, if not a surprise, for those at the beginning of the war. We're talking about Biden and Austin, the US Defense Secretary, who were talking about turning the Russian economy, the ruble, into rubble, was the phrase at the time. And so it's come as a huge disappointment for those who thought the economy would crumble under the weight of sanctions and other pressures. In fact, uh, it's managed to adjust. It hasn't, I, I'd slightly disagree. It's not so much militarized economy because Putin and so on has constantly said that they're not going to militarize it. And of course, there's elements of it. But on the other hand, uh, they are trying to keep the civilian economy going. So Vicky is absolutely right on that point. There's other things going on. It's a full service economy. And never before in history has such a huge economy been sanctioned or attempted to be undermined. So, and it's shown remarkable resilience. Chris, 
You've worked in Russia for a quarter of a century. You're in Moscow a lot. What are your observations on the Russian economy right now? Okay, well, for, look, when you're in central Moscow, it feels normal relative to how it was, what living conditions were uh, before 2022. Uh, shops are full. There, there was a period of adjustment in 2022 when you know, some goods, some consumer goods, for example, disappeared as, as companies left, but they've all reappeared through what's called parallel imports coming up through Central Asia, originating, say, Turkey, Dubai, places like that. So for ordinary people, services and goods are as available as they were before. It's, you know, when you're walking around the streets, you, you don't notice, a, notice any extra security or anything like that. Um, and people have jobs, uh, unemployment, is, is down to just under 3%, uh, which of course is, is, is a problem longer term with, with labor demographics, but nevertheless, for now, people have jobs uh, and incomes are, are growing in, in real terms. So, you know, relatively little dis disruption, but that's not to say that everything is, is, is ideal because below that, uh, people are a lot more fearful of, for example, what they say, what they're heard to be seeing, what opinions they express. It, it is very, well known at the level of, say, monitoring of what people are, are saying, particularly if they're critical of the government or of the military or anything associated with that, uh, then people will be a lot more fearful of, of expressing those opinions because they, they, they could be arrested or uh, get into difficulties. So you are very conscious of you know, the listening factor when you're out and about in Moscow. But otherwise, if you didn't turn the TV on, you would not know Russia was in a conflict. Wow. Vicky, I want to talk about sanctions. I mm. recently spoke to the Russian ambassador, as we've just heard at the start of this program. Bullish, confident, arrogant, you might say. He believes the sanctions have actually hurt the West more than they've hurt Russia. There is no doubt that the West has suffered, particularly from the fact uh, of uh, the cutoff in um, gas supplies from Russia. And look at Germany right now. Of course, it saw a fall in its GDP last year. But again, you could say that that was pretty resilient because the fall was just 0.4%. This is an economy that used to rely so heavily on Russian energy to fuel everything that, that it did. And uh, its industrial policy has had to be thrown out and rethought. So all the, those energy intensive sectors have suffered quite significantly. And what we've also seen, of course, is that Germany has managed to reduce at a cost its uh, energy consumption very significantly. That has affected, of course, the whole of Europe. Yes, there are some countries that are doing reasonably well, particularly the Southern European countries because of extra tourism in particular, uh, but certainly the sort of center of Europe and, and the Northern bit is, is being affected by the fact that uh, all those sanctions have uh, affected the West without any doubt. However, the sanctions are intensifying against Russia. It's true we've had, I think, the 13th package now of sanctions. Um, there is a cap, of course, on, on oil, the oil price that, that Russia can sell its oil at, which is not hugely effective. But there are loads of other things that are going on, including now um, the fact that sanctions have been extended to affect the countries and firms which are trying to circumvent those sanctions by selling directly, for example, to Russia or even collecting and then delivering the oil and gas that it has. Can I just ask, Richard, Looking ahead, how long can Russia keep going at the rate it wants to with sanctions in place as they are? It's a sort of race against time. Uh, uh, the sanctions are, the regime is being intensified. Uh, I think now the figure is unbelievable, something like 27,000 sanctions, that includes individual ones. Uh, and of course, the attempts to have the shadow fleet for energy exports, uh, the insurance crisis, there's all sorts of squeezes being put, put on it. On the other hand, each time uh, it's like whack-a-mole. Every time uh, the West puts on, do, does something, Russia does something in the reaction. And of course, it's got a whole networks, which is far more than a country, say, like Venezuela or Cuba, or even less, let alone North Korea and Iran to circumvent sanctions. This is a huge economy, a full service economy with long established links in, of course, Central Asia, South Caucasus, quite apart from its neighborhood, Turkey uh, and Iran and other countries. So how long can it go on for? Its inflation at the moment is at 7%. Uh, interest rates at, uh, I think, 16% now to try to stop this overheating. Um, so, uh, and in the long term, there's, of course, the, um, you know, the, the competitiveness and the 
uh, modernization, technological, because a lot of people who've left, maybe up to a million of the middle class, the most active uh, professional middle class is a lot of IT workers. So in the long term, but on the other hand, uh, there's constantly an attempt by the regime, by the system to uh, compensate for it. So, uh, I, I mean, it seems the, the system, Moscow Kremlin seems to believe that they can hang on in there for the long term. So whatever the West throws at them, they can react. And of course, there is even a school of thought in Moscow which says there's nothing, nothing better than sanctions has been uh, done for Russia ever. That this is a major achievement. I mean, the agriculture is booming as a result of import substitution. Obviously, it means that there's huge opportunities for the Chinese to come in. Of course, they're now the single largest motor car say, um, sellers of Chinese cars, which is interesting. A whole shift of the economy to the east and the Western phase of Russian development is over, not just for the short term, almost certainly for the medium term and possibly for a very long time. Chris, do you think Putin maybe has studied sanctions on other regimes like Iran in the build up to what he's done in Ukraine, that he's obviously an intelligent person, that you know, he, he's studied this and thought ahead about how he would handle sanctions because he would have known they were coming. Sure, but uh, nothing to the extent that we've had, uh, of course. Um, and, and one of the reasons why the Russian economy has actually proved quite resilient in the last couple of years is because they had a long period of notice, if you like, of preparation. Sanctions started, remember, in the spring of 2014. Um, and, you know, for when I was in Moscow at the time, and, you know, the Russian officials were listening to, at that time, officials in Brussels and Europe talking even then about the need to reduce, you know, the, the, the vulnerability to Russian energy or Russian imports. But of course, Europe did nothing about it until 2022. But the Russians did. They got that message loud and clear. And so, for example, in that eight-year period, uh, Russia reorientated a lot of its energy exports to, to China, to Asia. Uh, the, the, uh, as Richard mentioned, on the agriculture side, that actually was a big change because in 2013, Russia was importing more than 50% of its food consumption. But by 2022, it was a net exporter of, of food. So, it, uh, and it adjusted the financial system, created the direct settlement system with China. So there was a lot of, of, of preparation, but no, nobody talked about what was coming in, this, in the sort of sanctions that we've had since. But there is a very strong belief in, in Russia and in the government and amongst people generally of resilience. In other words, you know, whatever you throw at us, uh, we can adapt. We've always adapted. Uh, we're stubborn. We're resilient. And, and, and that's kind of, you know, you, 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 that's a belief that sustains the country a lot. I mean, to paraphrase Churchill, uh, Russia is a country that usually does the right thing when there's absolutely no other choice and only when there's no other choice. But then it does it. And so we've seen this, you know, adaption to sanctions a lot. And there is... You know, today you mentioned the, the interview with the, the ambassador and, and, and of course, a lot of confidence, but that confidence is based on the fact that Russia has survived much better than, you know, officials in the West had predicted two years ago. But there are still some very significant challenges ahead. Um, there is a belief in Russia that Russia can deal with those challenges and can, you know, grow the economy and, and can make the best of it, but yet to be proven. There are some very significant challenges that were known about before February 2022 that have now been shelved because of the shift to the military industrial complex, such as the decline in demographics, uh, et cetera, and, uh, you know, and infrastructure spending. Uh, and it's, it's, it's too early to have that sort of confidence that Russia will continue to thrive against sanctions. It's now moving in. I feel like the last two years have been crisis management and they've done well, but now they're having to deal with much more you know, entrenched problems. And, and it's a big question as to how the economy will, 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 will sort of grow or manage in the next couple of years. Vicky, it seems almost strange to say it, but has the war been good for Russia's economy? Because the figures they've posted, if you believe them, I mean, the UK doesn't get anywhere near these kind of growth figures. Well, look, there's a cost to the economy if you're spending so much money in one particular sector, which is exactly what's going on. The cost is that you neglect other sectors. Not completely, as we've just been discussing, but certainly you do neglect them for the longer term. And I think it's absolutely true that there are some challenges, there were some challenges of diversifying the economy, which simply hasn't been done. And then there is the, the, the other cost of, of how do you you know, if you like, uh, have access again to loads of your frozen funds, which have been frozen, of course, as we know, by, by the West. And right now there is big debate in Europe with the head of the European Commission suggesting that that money should be 
uh, used um, by the West to help Ukraine uh, in its issues regarding having adequate weapons to be able to defend itself. Uh, there may be some legal issues attached to that, but in Euroclear alone, I think there are 190 billion worth of euros which are frozen assets of, um, of Russia. And even if you just look at the interest that those assets are getting right now, there's, there's quite a lot of billions there that you could use for, for Ukraine. So, so there is an issue really as to whether you know, some of that money, which is quite significant in terms of its size, can never be used again. And then what they're losing in terms of technical type uh, imports from the West and, and cooperation that we all need in order to survive in this new age of AI and everything else, um, all that is going to cost them in the longer term without any doubt. So I think there is a limit. And if oil prices and those sanctions and oil prices do not rise because the economies generally are not growing very fast and look at what's going on in China, that whatever they were getting before, they're not going to be getting in the future in terms of the revenue. So you have to think that, that the ability to spend all that money on this war effort will have a limit at some point. Richard, I want to talk about population. All of the figures I've seen indicate that about 1% of Russia's population is either dead, injured or fled between fatalities on the battlefield and young men who wanted to avoid conscription. So 1% of the population, which is overwhelmingly young and male, that leaving the economy, leaving the population, what does that do long term to a country? Yeah. I mean, it's damaging, uh, and it compounds the demographic issue, which uh, was already there. Uh, there was very slow growth because of pro-natalist and other policies in the, from the late 200, 2000s, uh, but the, sh the tide shifted from 2018, and so natural demographic increase fell. Uh, but uh, yes, so indeed, it's damaging in the long term, and of course, the quality of uh, the state system of higher education is another one. Uh, it's becoming more how can I, less accessing uh, Western literature and in Western networks and so on. So uh, there's a demodernization at the level of higher education. So for the future, that's going to affect uh, the potential for economic and technological growth. But at the same time, in pure manpower, man per person power, there's quite a lot of immigration and of course, uh, workers from Central Asia in particular. I mean, we're talking about Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, which get up to uh, half of their GDP comes from remittances. And since the Russian economy is now booming, uh, they're now back after the pandemic. It fell sharply then. So there are countervailing forces in pure, you know, person power terms. Uh, but it's, it's in the long term. I mean, of course, Russia is, finds itself like Japan and so many other countries with very, very low birth rate. Russia is a bit higher than the average, I mean, but it's still below replacement rate. So just on that point, do you think the former Soviet republics like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, places like that, that manpower will be brought in from those places to replace the young men who are either dead, injured or, or have fled? It's coming in already. I mean, Kyrgyzstan is part of the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, and I've spoken to many people, I'm sure this as well, uh, from Kyrgyzstan who were absolutely delighted with it when it came in because they're totally visa-free and totally, you know, like European Union. Uh, and so there's very large, Tajikistan has got special arrangements. It's not part of the Eurasian Economic Union. So yes, they, they are. And of course, there's a million Armenians working in Russia. I don't know how many Georgians, but I think not much short of that. So yes, it's got a huge hinterland uh, where booming population growth, so it compensates it. But of course, this has social and obviously xenophobia is under control at the moment. It's not as bad as it was, but it's a, there's a subtext going on, clearly, as in all countries where mass immigration takes place. Chris, Russia is now spending 6% of its GDP on defence and the military. Most European countries are struggling to meet NATO's required 2%. How sustainable is that long term if Russia keeps pumping billions and billions of rubles into the military? It's sustainable so long as the budget revenues uh, remain as they are, which are highly dependent on, on uh, oil exports, for example, or hydrocarbon exports. So that's, that's a critical factor. We saw that last year when first half of 2023, the level of oil receipts was well below that targeted and the budget deficit went up to about 3% by the middle of last year before it then re recovered. And bearing in mind that Russia cannot borrow any money and the reserves, as Vicky mentioned, are frozen, then you know that 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 was a point of of at least brief uh, crisis before the oil prices 
went, went up a bit again. So that's a, an important factor. Uh, secondly, you know, it, uh, you know I, I guess you could say it, it can continue for, for a couple of years with this uh, shift to military industrial complex. But eventually you have to start spending money on, on, on social supports, on healthcare, on job creation, and on other parts of the economy. Um, because, you know, we, we talked about uh, people and demographics. This is something that has changed in Russia that I've observed in my time there. You know, people are not the same as in the Soviet Union, where they just accepted everything. For now, life is fine uh, in, in Russia. The, the main concern is whether or not there'll be another round of mobilization, whether people will be forced into the military. And that's something the Kremlin has been very careful and very wary of it. But it is beginning to emerge. It's now called the white scarf protest. People are wearing either white neckerchiefs or women white scarves. Again, it's a sign of protest about mobilization. But, you know, it's not really a, a big issue in terms of destabilizing the country or, or, or society because the economy is good and there's enough money to go around everywhere. So, look, the, the short answer to your question is it really depends on how much money the country is earning from exporting, particularly commodities, particularly oil, if that stays around the current level, then the situation as we have it today, which is about two to two and a half percent GDP growth, relative stability, is probably uh, you can you can keep that up for, for several years. I mean, over the next several years, it's, it's we're not looking at any near-term crisis. Oil prices collapse, picture changes quickly. Vicky, Richard, and Chris, thank you all for your insight on this roundtable. Remember. You can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. And if you like what you see, please do hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me and Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.